Welcome to my session about continuous integration to automate your Drupal workflow. Um, I'm honored to speak here today in Dublin. Um, I hope you've seen several good sessions today. Uh, this will be the last session. Uh, you're probably dying to get a beer uh, after this one, so I'll dive straight in. My name is Bas van der Heide. You pronounce that like a bus, a school bus. I work at Immer, which is a Dutch uh, Drupal shop in Rotterdam. And I work there as partner and uh, full stack developer, which means that I know uh, stuff about the whole process of web development, ranging from front end to back end uh, to DevOps. So that, that's why it's my responsibility at Immer to, uh, to, have, to implement the continuous integration workflow. So first I wanted to start with, uh, why would you even want continuous integration? Uh, the first reason is for quality, and there are two sub-reasons for that. Uh, the first quality reason is that uh, uh, if you have continuous deployment set up, um, uh, because we are all humans, stuff can go south if you manually deploy your Drupal projects. So if you do that through the uh, process of continuous deployment, uh, you will make sure that there is no human interference, and that uh, uh, gives a boost to quality. But also, uh, uh, your code structure will be better if you uh, implement continuous integration through the notion of testing, because then you can make sure that your code is being tested prior to deploying, and that also boosts uh, the, quality, the quality of your code. The second reason is for consistency. So if you have continuous integration set up, that's an automated uh, process, which means that it's the same every time you deploy. So uh, you have a consi consistent process for your deployments. And also for speed, of course, because it's a real time saver, because if you have to manually deploy and manually test every, th every time you, you do a code change, uh, that will eat away precious time as well. So those are the three main reasons why you would uh, want continuous integration within your projects. So to start off with uh, the definition of continuous integration. Continuous integration is a software development practice in which you build, in which you test, and in which you deploy software every time a developer pushes code to the application. Um, so it was my responsibility at Immer to implement uh, continuous integration, and I want to take you through these three concepts, building, testing, and deploying, and tell you more about how we did it, why we did it, and uh, which uh, processes it entails. Okay, to start off with the build aspect of continuous integration. I will first tell you something about the Git workflow we use and how it offers uh, continuous deployments. Then I will tell you about development machines, uh, which we use for our projects to maintain uh, the same experience for each developer involved. I will also tell you about task runners and how it uh, uh, makes projects uh, um, understandable and more easy to manage. Uh, then I will tell you about package managers, because that will uh, keep your projects lightweight and small. And lastly, I will tell you about the two repositories we use for each project. So to start off with the Git workflow. Uh, when we started implementing continuous integration, we were searching for uh, a suitable uh, Git branching model or Git workflow. So the first workflow we looked at was the immensely popular uh, Git flow, which is illustrated by this uh, picture. Um, and I'm curious, uh, which one of you fully uses this Git flow? And by fully, I mean not only the aspects you like, but the whole uh, Git flow in its entirety. Okay, that's, that's not, not many people, uh, uh, which I already uh, suspected. Um, uh, so, so first, about the Git workflow, it's a very complete uh, flow in the sense that it entails everything that you need uh, to do uh, uh, continuous integration. It offers non-linear development. Uh, it offers the possibility of hot fixes to address uh, issues you may have on production sites. Uh, it offers release branches. It offers uh, uh, topic branches. So in that sense, it's a really complete workflow. But yet, it can be quite complicated. Uh, especially for new developers or people that are new to Git, 
um, uh, it's, it's very difficult to understand all the intricacies uh, of the Git workflow. So we found it good, but a bit too complicated. The next flow uh, we looked at uh, is called the GitHub flow, which is really GitHub's answer to the, to the Git flow we saw before. So the, in the GitHub flow, there's only one long-lived branch, which is the master branch. And then you, uh, uh, when you want to do some work, you branch off that master branch, you do your work, and you integrate that branch back into the master branch, ultimately. Of course, as you can see, this is much, much simpler. But maybe it's a bit too simple, because it, it doesn't cover all the workflows that, that is necessary to, uh, to have nonlinear development, but also to have hotfixes, for instance. So we found that a bit too simple. So that's why we invented our own uh, workflow, which we call the Merge Request Workflow. And I will tell you step by step uh, how it works and what it entails. So as a start, it's basically the same as the GitHub flow you saw before. You have a master branch and you have separate topic branches uh, in which you isolate your development, in which you isolate your, your, your features as well. But in a Merge Request Workflow, uh, uh, you start by creating a topic branch. So uh, um, you have a new feature request, and at that point you create a separate topic branch to implement that feature. Secondly, you do your work, of course. So you create some commits that implement that feature. Then, at that point, you create a merge request. And now it's the, it's the responsibility for another developer within your team to closely look at your code uh, uh, before accepting it. So at this point, a discussion uh, may arise uh, uh, of the code that may be on the level of code style, but it may also be uh, certain solutions you implemented. Uh, uh, why did you do it this way? Aren't there better ways? So this process means that there are always more than two eyes on the same piece of code before it gets, gets integrated. And also, uh, um, at this point, the code can go back and forth between ready to be able to merge or additional work needed. So uh, um, sometimes it happens that the code can be readily integrated, but other times uh, uh, heavy discussions arise and you, you have to alter your code uh, uh, before it can be merged. So finally, uh, you have to merge your code back into the master branch. And now the second step in the merge request workflow are uh, these other long-lived branches, as we call them. So um, it's important here to understand that we have one branch for each environment that we have for our project. So in this example, we have three environments. We have our staging environment, uh, uh, which is mapped to the master branch. We have our pre-production environment, which is uh, um, mapped to the pre-production branch. So that's our acceptance env environment where the client can see the work that has been done. And ultimately, you also have the production branch. So every time you push to one of these long-lived branches, that triggers an automated deployment to that environment. And I will get back uh, to that later. But for now, it's important to understand that these, uh, uh, the flows in which uh, the merges happen are always acyclic. So that means that it always flows from left to right. So first, your code gets integrated into the master branch. Secondly, uh, uh, via a new merge request, it uh, gets deployed on the pre-production branch and gets merged there and then on the production branch. <coughs> so finally, you, always, uh, you, you also want a strategy to be able to address uh, um, issues you have on your production environment. Um, so you can do that via the hotfix branches. And this is the only ex uh, uh, exception to the rule in which you branch off your production branch. So you check out your production branch first, then you created a separate topic branch, so to speak, but in this case it's a hotfix branch because you want to address an issue on production. Uh, you, you, you do some work, and then via merge request, it gets merged back into the production branch. And at that point, an automated deployment happens again on the production branch, so also on your production server, and the bug uh, has been solved. Also, of course, it's very important because this acyclic nature uh, uh, where code flows from left to right, 
that you also merge this hotfix branch inside your master branch as well. So it will get deployed on staging and at a later point maybe on your pre-production uh, environment. So the best is to visualize this. Uh, uh, the blue circle is uh, uh, a new feature. So you start off by creating this topic branch and you first create some commits. <coughs> and uh, uh, there may be more commits if a discussion arises and you have to alter your code uh, uh, as necessary. Then you merge the topic branch inside your master branch. So at this point you can see your code on your staging environment. If everything goes well, then at a later point, the master branch gets merged into the pre-production branch and this triggers a deployment on the acceptance environment and ultimately on the production environment. So this flow has the benefit that, is, that it uh, uh, covers all scenarios. So it's in that sense the same as the Git flow but it's much, much simpler to use and easier to understand. The second aspect about continuous integration build aspect I want to tell you about uh, is our development machine. So you've all probably had scenarios uh, in which you deployed some code, you, you did some work on your local machine, you deployed it to production, and then you got some fatal error because uh, for instance, a PHP module uh, was not enabled on production, which, which it was on, on, on your local machine, or you have a different version of Apache Solar installed on production. So uh, to summarize, there is a mismatch at this point between your local environment and how, what that look li looks like and your production server and all the packages installed on that environment. So to mitigate this issue, uh, all of our project ship with a separate development virtual machine, which can uh, differ between projects. So uh, we use two techniques to accomplish this. The first one is Vagrant, which is a scriptable virtual machine, uh, which is very suitable if your production environment is self-contained. And by self-contained, I mean that all the packages you need in order for your website to work are installed on the same server. So you have your MySQL database, your, your, your web server, uh, Apache or Nginx, for example, your Memcache server, and maybe Solar. So that's all contained in one, uh, on one production server. Then you can use uh, Vagrant, and you can script your virtual machine just in the same way as you, as you uh, have set up your production machine, and you have uh, the resemblance there. But in other cases, um, um, where you have more complex setups on your production machine, uh, it quickly becomes complicated because uh, uh, you may have a front varnish uh, proxy, for example, with different web servers behind, or you may have uh, MySQL servers, several of them, in a master-slave combination. So then it becomes tiresome for Vagrant to, uh, to script this. So this is where Docker comes in. So I won't dive deep uh, into the intricacies of Docker itself, but uh, for now it will suffice to say that it's uh, a lightweight container, uh, uh, that you can have lightweight containers in Docker, so you can separate concerns. And by lightweight, that means that um, um, uh, it won't blow up your local machine. So you can have one container that is your Varnish server, then you can have multiple MySQL servers inside containers, so you can easily replicate the situation you have on production on your local machine as well. So the next section I want to tell you about are task runners. So at Immer we use a grunt as our task runner, and we mainly do that to abstract away all the complicated commands that one has to know to, for instance, boot up your virtual machine. So, uh, generally speaking, a front-end developer working at a project doesn't really care if you use uh, Vagrant or Docker or maybe uh, Kubernetes underneath for your virtual machine, for your development machine. Uh, all he cares about is running his site. So that's why we, we have one command, which is called gruntvm, and that's responsible for booting up this shared virtual machine. So whether you, whether you use uh, Docker or Vagrant underneath, 
uh, that doesn't really matter anymore. So on the other hand, uh, uh, the backend developer doesn't really care uh, what you use to compile your uh, CSS files. So maybe you use less, or maybe you use SAS, or maybe stylus. And the backend developer, all he cares about is seeing a pretty site and developing his, his stuff on top of that. So uh, uh, to accomplish this, we have one command, grunt theme, and that's responsible for compiling all our assets, maybe minifying. Um, uh, maybe you have Webpack for your JavaScript uh, uh, modules as well. And grunt theme is just one command uh, that does all that stuff. So we use grunt for this purpose, but there are many, many solutions to achieve uh, exactly the same result. So you could use uh, gulp, um, um, which all the new kids use, I believe, uh, which is just, just as fine. You can also use npm scripts or just plain old bash scripts if you don't like uh, to have a task runner installed. Uh, that doesn't really matter as long as you have one uh, front controller to rule them all. So the developer only has to memorize grunt VM and that boots up his machine. The next section I want to tell you about is package managers. Package managers allow you to keep your repository relatively small and lightweight. So instead of having all your third party assets installed directly within the repository, uh, you reference them from the package files. So we have several package managers installed. Uh, we use NPM, and we use that for our uh, grunt uh, uh, plugins and our front-end assets, such as Bootstrap or Font Awesome. We could, of course, also use Bower for that, but that adds another package manager, so we opted to use NPM instead. Um, we use Bundler for our uh, SAS compilation and also for our SCSS linting, which I will get back on later. <coughs> And we use Composer for our uh, uh, PHP assets. And also in the case of Drupal 8, we use it for our uh, uh, contributed themes, modules, uh, and everything else that Drupal needs. So package managers allow you to keep uh, your repository lightweight. You don't store the packages directly, uh, but you have the package manager set up. But of course, this situation can become quite complicated, as is illustrated very well uh, by this tweet from Stephen Baumgartner. So he says, what's Bauer? It's a package manager. You can install it with Brew. Uh, install it with NPM. What's NPM? It's a package manager. You can install it with Brew. <laughs> what's Brew? And so, and so on and so on. So the current situation with all the different package managers available uh, gets complicated quite easily. So to mitigate this issue somewhat, we use NPM as our global uh, package manager, so to speak. So NPM has this notion of post-install uh, scripts or hooks. So you can put commands inside the post-install script. Uh, um, uh, so in our case, we have the composer install and the bundle install inside our post-install hook. So, every, uh, uh, so the thing a developer has to memorize is just run NPM install uh, if he does a git, an, an initial git clone, and that will be responsible for uh, running the composer install and the bundle install. So with this setup, um, uh, you can also add Bower quite easily. Just add another package, and you add it to the post install hook, and it will take care of the rest. The last package manager I wanted to tell you about is Drush Make. Um, um, so for your old projects, mainly uh, uh, Drupal 7 or, or backwards, you could use Drush Make as a package manager to download all your contributed modules, <coughs> themes, and libraries. So just as uh, with Composer and the current situation in Drupal 8, you can use Composer to download uh, all the modules and also the core of Drupal if necessary. Uh, you could use Drush Make for uh, old versions of Drupal. So in this example, uh, this is just a snippet out of my Drush Make file for Drupal 7 project. Um, um, I have field group, field permissions, and Google Analytics, and I just specify them inside a YAML file, and Drush Make will be responsible for downloading the right versions of the right modules. So also, this, uh, this makes sure that you have a very 
easy update path. So if you want to update Google Analytics to version 2.4, for example, you just uh, change that one line, you rerun the grunt make command, and it will, it will auto-download uh, the new package. So last uh, aspect of building uh, I wanted to tell you about is the two repositories we use. So what I've just all told you about uh, uh, is concerned in the development repository. So the development repository contains everything that makes the life of a developer easier in the sense that it contains the package managers, it contains the development virtual machine, uh, it contains all the grunt plugins. So everything for a developer to do his work properly, and we call that our smart repository. But we also have a second repository, which we call our dump build repository, and those, in that repository, we store the build artifacts of our development repository. So the build repository only contains the compiled C uh, CSS files, the minified JavaScript files, uh, uh, and nothing, nothing else uh, so just code to be able to run it on your production server. So via this mechanism, you can separate your concerns because uh, uh, we host our projects at various locations. And if you would have your development repository checked out on all those locations, you would have many uh, 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 packages to install on those locations as well. Because you will, have to have, uh, you will need uh, your grant to compile uh, uh, your, your JavaScript files. You will need SES to compile your CSS files. So all those packages uh, uh, just add up to the complexity of your project. So if you have a se separate build repository, you, you abstract away all those, all those intricacies to the development repository and only the build artifacts will be deployed on your production server. So I have seen uh, other agencies also have some form of build artifacts and mostly that happens as a tarball, which they then are sync over to their production server. But we opted to store everything within the build repository in Git as well, because that offers us to have all the advantages of version control that we like so much. Uh, so we can tag releases, and we can refer to those releases by their tag names. Uh, we can have automated release notes, uh, um, that's just the sum of all the commit messages that you've placed. You can have date information to properly see when you did previous releases. You can easily do a git diff between two releases, for example, to see what has been changed between uh, release X and Y. And last but not least, you have an easy rollback mechanism because you can just go to the production server, check out an old tag, and uh, uh, the rest is taken care of. So to summarize the building aspect. So first we maintain a Git workflow that everyone understands and make sure that we can do our automated deployments properly. Then we make our project reproducible with a development virtual machine. So every developer has the same experience for their project while working on it. <clears throat> Next we keep our repository clean with package managers. And we have a clear and understandable build process with task runners. So there's only several commands each developer has to, has to know and understand uh, uh, in order to accomplish certain tasks. And lastly, we separate our concerns, uh, concerns with a separate build repository next to our development repository, which is checked out on our production server. So the next section in continuous integration is about testing. And I want to touch briefly on PHP, uh, JavaScript, and CSS. So when I talk about testing, I actually mean static analysis testing, which I also call the low-hanging fruit of testing. So there have been many talks before about uh, unit testing, integration testing, uh, that really runs your code, uh, which is good practice. But now I want to focus more on static analysis testing. And that's testing uh, from a static perspective. So that means that your code is not being run. So there, is, there are these tools that just look at your code. So what can static ana <coughs> analysis accomplish? It can look at coding standards, for instance. 
So when to use camel casing and when not. Um, if you, if you uh, 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 have successfully abided by the, the Drupal standards, the Drupal coding standards, it can look at code complexity in the sense of method length or nesting too deep, stuff like that. And it can also look at unused variables, so variables you've declared and then never used again. So we enforce our static analysis testing firstly by uh, Git hooks. So that means that every time you, you issue a Git commit, uh, that triggers a grunt test command. And grunt test is another example of a front controller command that is responsible for kicking in all the static analysis tools uh, we have for the project. And which tools that are may differ from project to project. So that's why uh, the grunt test command uh, works as a front controller that way. So via this mechanism, you can make sure that every time you do a git commit, grunt test is being issued, and you know that your code is okay on a basic level. Coding standards are applied, stuff like that. Of course, also the grunt test command runs prior to each deployment you do. So that means that uh, uh, if you push your code and it gets deployed, then first the grunt test command is run, and if, if, if there's a mistake there, if something uh, went south, uh, your code is not being deployed. So now I want to uh, tell you about some of the tools we use uh, uh, as our static analysis testing tools. So the first one is the immensely popular coder module, uh, the Drupal module. The coder module uses PHP code sniffer underneath. And uh, um, via configuration, you can set it up to check your code for certain uh, uh, style aspects. So in this case, <coughs> I have used the T function in my Drupal 7 project inside my hook menu, which I shouldn't have. And uh, the coder module finds bugs like these and tells you about it. The second tool is called PHP Mess Detector. And that looks at your PHP code from a more general perspective. So it doesn't look at your coding standards, but it looks at code size rules, for instance. So if you have a method within a class that is too long, in this case, 176 lines, then it's probably a good candidate, candidate to split it up on, into uh, multiple functions of its own. So you can have it enforce a certain threshold, say 100 lines of code for a method, and then enforce that structure. Also, it looks at naming rules. So in this case, I had a variable called s, $s, which is not very descriptive uh, uh, for naming your variable. So you can also have a threshold here that your variable should be three characters minimum, for example. And another example is unused code rules. So here I've, I've declared a variable that I've never used, and it starts complaining about that as well. The next tool uh, is called the Security Advisory Checker, which is a really handy tool because it looks at your composer.log file uh, maps that against a database of known vulnerabilities and tells you about those known vulnerabilities if you have a package installed uh, uh, which has a leak inside of it. So a while back, for one of my projects, um, um, I started noticing that my deployments were suddenly failing. Uh, so um, I went into the project and saw what was going south, and it was the Gussel library. So there was this leak in Gussel not too long ago, um, um, so this leak was reported within that da database and my security checker was failing. So if I didn't have this process uh, there, I wouldn't have known that uh, Gussel had this vulnerability inside. But because I had the security checker, uh, my deployments were failing, I had to update Gussel uh, in order for my de deployments to start uh, running again. So this is a real uh, uh, time saver. Also, what we use is PHP copy-paste detector, which you can also uh, uh, configure a threshold, and then it looks at your code uh, for code you've duplicated more than one time. So this keeps your code dry. If you have the same uh, uh, 10 lines of code on three different places, for example, that's probably a good candidate to abstract away inside a, inside a function or inside a class. So the copy-paste detector finds issues like these and enforces that. 
The last tool, the last PHP tool is called the PHP Reaper. So what that does is it finds potential SQL injections inside your query statements. So of course, since Drupal 7, we use the database abstraction layer. So that's not really needed uh, anymore. But if you still have older code or if you, or if you use uh, DB query directly and you have an SQL injection inside those, it will find it. Of course, your code doesn't only consist in, in PHP code alone. There's also JavaScript code that needs testing. So for this purpose, we use gshint. <coughs> gshint is just like the PHP mess detector, sort of, but then for uh, your JavaScript code. So uh, what it does, examples of what it does, is it enforces trick checking with, that you use uh, uh, triple equal signs instead of double equal signs uh, everywhere. It prohibits you from nesting your code too deep. So if you have an if within an if within an if and that 10 times deep, it will start complaining as well. And it also detects unused variables and this is just the, the top of the iceberg. Uh, there are actually uh, some uh, alternatives to gshint. Uh, the first alternative is called gslint, which was uh, written by Douglas Crockford. He's a really good uh, JavaScript developer. But the problem with gslint is, uh, uh, so he has a real strong opinion about how, you, uh, how he wants people to write JavaScript. So with gslint, it's not configurable at all. Uh, you just have to write the same code as Douglas Crockford does. So if you like his style, you can, you can definitely use uh, JSLint. Also, there is ESLint, which is also very powerful because it, uh, it also offers the possibility to check your JavaScript uh, ES2015 code. So if you're into that, ESLint is your tool probably. So here are some examples of what gshint can find. So here I've missed the semicolon in the first example. The second example shows that I've used two equal signs instead of triple. And the third is a variable that I've declared and never used. So as you can see, it also points out the location where you, you've made a mistake. So that makes up for easy fixing. So the last uh, tool I want to tell you about is scsslint. SCSS lint is, is, is also a linter tool, just as gshint and the PHP mess detector is, but then for your SAS code. So what that does is enforce structure in your SCSS code as well. So you can have it enforce property ordering, for example, that you have all your properties within your uh, selectors alphabetically ordered. Uh, you can also have it prevent inline hexadecimal codes so you use your variables you've set up for all your colors instead of the direct hexadecimal codes. You can have it enforce single quote structure or double quotes if you prefer that. And it, it prevents Ill illegal uh, uh, statements such as border none, which is strictly speaking illegal. It should be border zero. So it also finds stuff like that. And last but not least, it uh, uh, enables you to disable units. So if you and your team uh, agreed upon using REM for your new project, and a new developer joins and starts using pixels everywhere, uh, SCSS Lint will start complaining about that. So here's another example of what SCSS Lint can check. So here I've set it up to uh, that each selector, if, if, I've, if I have multiple selector statements, uh, should be on its own line, and I forgot some. And the second example is, is, is uh, properties should be ordered by border, color, font family, font weight. So in this example, I've set it up to have an alphabetical ordering uh, um, and, and, and it didn't check that. So uh, uh, the drawback of SCSS lint is it doesn't show you the code just as gshint does. gshint really uh, shows you the code where, where, where you, you made a mistake. And here you have to look up the line numbers yourself. So to summarize, <clears throat> what does static analysis testing do for you? Well, first and foremost, it greatly reduces your code review time because uh, um, at Imra, uh, there are always more than two eyes looking at the same code. And by having your code confide with basic standards, so your Drupal standards are okay, you don't have methods with 200 lines, 
all stuff like that is taken care of. So the developer can really focus, the reviewer can really focus on the code itself and the contents of your code. Secondly, static analysis enforces structure in your code. So you and your team can uh, uh, sit around the table and discuss how you want code to be written, and then you can have static analysis testing enforce that. And last but not least, static analysis tools are highly configurable, so you can, uh, each of these tools I told you about, with GSLint being the exception, you can configure to your own needs. So the last aspect I want to tell you about is the deployment mechanism, the automated deployment mechanism. And I will do that by telling you about build pipelines, stages and tasks, and finally something about environments. So we at Immer, we really love uh, GitLab and the way it's going. We don't only use it for our issue tracking system, but we also use it uh, uh, to automate our deployments and to have continuous integration set up. So a build in GitLab runs through a pipeline, and that pipeline is the same uh, for the same project over and over again. So you can specify what that pipeline looks like on a per project basis, and then that pipeline is the same uh, uh, throughout all your builds. So of course you can have uh, multiple builds for the same project and that builds run through that pipeline. A pipeline consists of one or more stages, and it's important to remember that these stages run in serial, which, mean, which means that first the first stage is run, and when it is completely finished, then the second stage will run, and finally the third stage, so you can have dependency, a dependency mechanism inside your build process. The stage further down consists of tasks, one or more tasks, and these tasks run in parallel. So that means that these two tasks run at the same time, and when they're both completed, will the next stage kick in. So you can see this process also via the UI. Here I've, de I've declared four stages, my prepare stage, my build stage, my test stage, and my deploy stage, and you can see the green question marks, uh, the green check marks, which means that all the stages were completed. Here you can see the prepare uh, uh, stage consists of three tasks, which is the installation of all my packages. So composer install, bundler install, and npm install in this case. So they can ru ru all run at the same time, and if they're all three finished, then the make stage uh, uh, will take place. So what this pipeline looks like, you can define in your GitLab CI YAML file. So first, typically you start your, your GitLab CI YAML file with uh, listing your stages. And underneath, you start defining tasks. And you map tasks to a certain stage. So that means that task one in this example <coughs> is part of stage one. Then via the script key, uh, uh, you can give it uh, a script, so that that means that uh, uh, for the task one example, npm install will run as the task, and when it's finished, the task will be finished as well. Lastly, you can have it uh, have artifacts. So npm installs within the node modules folder, so you want everything within the node modules folder folder to be taken into account for your next steps, and you can also make these uh, artifacts downloadable. In the deployment task, you can see the environment and only key, which I will get back on shortly. So now I want to tell you something about uh, the several tasks we have, we have set up. So this is an example of the composer task. What it, it's part of our prepare uh, uh, stage, which means that prior to deploying, you, you want your composer libraries to be installed. So the script, it has this composer install, and you can see the output on the right. So you have Composer install, it installs the, the, all, the, all the libraries, and then it uploads everything inside the vendor directory uh, to the CI server for later use. A second example is our test code uh, task. So that's part of the test 
stage. And what it does is it runs grunt test, as I explained earlier. So you can see on the right what it does. It does the PHP mess detector first, then PHP lint, which I didn't even tell you about, but that just checks if you have any syntax errors within your PHP files. Because then again, static analysis testing only looks at your code from a static perspective, so it will not by default find any syntax errors because it will not actually run your code. Uh, uh, you have your GS hint set up, so that will check your JavaScript code, your SCSS lint, and finally it checks if your translations for all your modules are in place. So you can have it have dependencies on other tasks as well. So in this case, uh, I want to have my NPM bundler and composer as dependencies. So it will take all the artifacts from those tasks into account before running the test code script. Here's an example of our deployment uh, script <coughs> task. It's part of our deploy stage, and the script it runs is grunt deploy, and then our environment, in this case, uh, staging. So grunt deploy is another example of a front controller command that is responsible for uh, the things you see on the right. So in this case, SSHing to the staging server, checking out the deployed tag, uh, uh, clearing the cache, then importing your database, uh, uh, your, your configuration uh, management, and then running any database updates if necessary. So what the grunt deploy task does uh, changes per project, of course, because for a Drupal 7 project, uh, you probably want a feature revert, for example. But by having this front controller command, uh, uh, which is the same always, uh, you can have one mechanism in place. So you also see here the environment, <coughs> double colon, staging, and the only master. So that means that this task is mapped to a certain environment, in this case the staging environment, and that this task will only run on a certain branch, in this case the master branch. So via this mechanism you can have a branch mapped uh, to an environment, which you will also see here. So here I've got two tasks. I've got the deploy to staging task and the deploy to production task. And the deploy to production task only runs on the production branch. And the deploy to staging task only runs on the master branch. So this offers you the possibility to have these uh, branch mappings. Branch always maps to a certain environment. So here you can also see that in the user interface. So you can see your, your environments. In this case, I have two environments. You can see when you've done the last deployment, what commits it point to and how long it was ago. If you click on a, on a certain environment, in this case a staging environment, you can, e you can easily see all the previous deployments you've done as well and see more information. So here you see uh, that I've deployed an hour ago and then seven days ago, and you can even do an easy rollback. So that story where I told you, told you you have to manually SSH to your server and check out a tag, that's not even necessary. You can do it via the UI as well. So to summarize, uh, deploying with GitLab, a build always runs through a configurable pipeline that you define on a per project basis. Then a build consists of multiple stages, one or multiple, which run in serial. And then a stage consists of multiple tasks that run in parallel, that run at the same time. And finally, you can map a task to an environment for your deployment purposes. I thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, I will ask you to use the microphone. Hello. Um, does GitLab provide a user interface to display test reports or other reports like crappiness detector and all this stuff? Um, the reason why we don't do GitLab so far and uh, went with Jenkins is because they have a user interface to display all these reports. Yes, yes, you can actually. Um, so let me get back to that slide. So here you can see all the stages. 
and you can see which tasks uh, a stage did. And you cannot see it here, of course, but if you click on one of those tasks, it shows you the, the exact output of the task it runs. So via that mechanism, you can easily check uh, what went south. So if, if, if something went wrong, you will see a red cross, for instance, at the test code uh, uh, task, and you can click on that, and you will see what went wrong there. Does that answer your question? Yes, indirectly. So you don't have a real user interface to go deeper into the test reports and see w what line or file or whatever uh, was affected. Or see graphs like uh, how the crappiness uh, progresses over your code. Well, well, yes, you can because the, all, all the test commands have, have some form of output. So for example, uh, this is the output of our S SCSS linter. So this will show, if, if you click on the test code uh, task uh, uh, and it went wrong for these reasons, you, you can easily see them. And also you can have, uh, via, via this uh, uh, build artifacts, you can also generate reports and have, have them downloadable as artifacts. So you can, after the build has been completed, uh, um, regardless of whether it went, whether it filled or not, you can download your reports. Hi, um, so we use Jenkins, as I'm sure there will be other people in the room. Is there a specific reason that you chose to use uh, GitLab over Jenkins and or any other competitive, uh, competing, competing um, <laughs> software packages? Well, uh, the main reason we use GitLab is just that it resonates well with our brain. Uh, they, they recently released their master plan. Uh, I just think, generally speaking, GitLab is going in the right direction and it offers so much more than continuous integration alone. So it offers these, uh, uh, I haven't shown you, but the merge requests. So via the UI, you can create your merge request, assign them to users, and also refer to issues, because we also use it as our issue tracking system. So in that sense, we use GitLab as a total package for everything. How do you keep uh, up to date uh, and uh, secure the software on uh, the uh, live uh, on the production machine and uh, uh, well the the basic basic software like uh, php and uh, apache and the system software and uh, the uh, the website the web application well for our, all our underlying techniques so php apache all those packages we still do uh, manually, but for our Drupal uh, modules and, and stuff like that, uh, we also use uh, uh, the CI tool. Uh, we have an update script, which is also a task. And what it does is it checks our, our composer.json file for all the contributed modules we have installed. And in case uh, of Drupal 7 projects, it checks our Drush make file, and it, and it checks it against the, the, the update uh, XML on drupal.org. And if there are security updates, it auto uh, updates the, the, the Drush make file, for example, and then also automatically create a merge request and assign it to one of our developers uh, in order to, be, to test it before deploying it to, uh, to production directly. Uh, hello. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on how do you send uh, or compile everything from the developer repository to the build repository? Like you create a grant task that will copy stuff and select which one is copied and compile mm -hmm. the SAS files to there or something. So yes, that, that, that is what we call our, our, our make uh, command. So what that does is it first installs all, all necessary things. So uh, for instance, it looks at the Drush make file, downloads Drupal core, downloads all our contributed uh, modules, then compiles uh, our SAS files. So then we have a local um, setup that, that you can run, that you can view as a website, as a whole. And then that whole directory gets r -synced to a separate directory. That's our build uh, directory, uh, which is stored in Git. And then we just automatically do a Git commit on that one and, and a Git tag, and we push that up to the, to, to the build repository. So that's quite simple. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. 
Um, do you are you planning or are you doing any kind of browser testing to check because we're talking about committing changes and deploying to the leaf server, but do you use, do you use any kind of browser testing to check that actually your site is not really broken or really badly broken with some of your commits? I mean, it just check if their leaf site is still working after your commit or something like that. Uh, we use browser testing for one of our projects, but we still uh, do that locally, unfortunately, because uh, within our build mechanism, there is there, there is no running site. So that's why we also use the static analysis testing as, as much as possible. There's no uh, uh, running database uh, there, uh, neither. So the next step uh, we're, we're currently looking at is, is uh, uh, creating an environment every time uh, a build occurs. And that will enable us uh, to do um, more thorough testing in terms of unit testing, browser testing. Hi. Um, how long did it take you to implement this entire workflow from the start to the finish? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that took us a while, to be honest. And, and of course, it's not a binary. It's not either you, you don't have continuous integration or you do. Uh, there's always a path in which you start implementing more and more. So um, what I would advise, if, if, if this sounds interesting, uh, first start by uh, just using GitLab, for example, but it can also be Jenkins, and then gradually work your way up. So maybe then a few weeks later, you can, you can implement static analysis testing and just one tool and then maybe two tools and just add, add up and work your way up that way. So for us, that took about maybe half a year or so from zero to where we are right now. <coughs> All right, uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>